I'm Steve Fenar. We're coming to you from uh, Covington, Washington, and um, I'm honored and blessed to introduce my dear friend uh, Gwen Eldridge. And um, I basically grew up with her family, went to church together. Her, you know, my folks and her folks are friends. They babysat us when we were kids. Kids, our kids, you know, us kids played with her kids, and um, you know, their brothers and my brothers are real close and. Um, you know, I, I ran a um, I ran a ministry about I don't know 13, 14 years ago in a club, and um, her boy Derek at the time was was a methamphetamine dealer, and he would he would come into the club, you know, all decked out in his leather coats and big gold jewelry, and um, and when he was real paranoid, because that's the only place he said he could feel peace when he was real paranoid, and uh, he gets so paranoid that he he pull the car in the, in the garage and paint it a different color. And he, he said he did that three times in one day. <laughs> but he was there, He was successful at, at dealing dope. I never was. I, I, I do all my dope. But he was successful, and he'd come in the club, and he'd reach in his pocket and, and, and pull out $100 bills, and he'd give me two $300 bills at a time. He wasn't even walking with the Lord, and he was still giving to the Lord's work. And I always thought that was an amazing fact about Derek. And then, um, you know, years down the Lord... Years down the road, he, he came to the Lord, and then he got clean and sober, and he put himself through um, school and became a drug and alcohol counselor and was like eight years sober. And then he took a job with uh, homeless men down in Seattle for less money so he could be a blessing to them and help them and uh, had a heart of gold and a heart for God and a heart for people. And, um, and then, um, you know, of course, what happens is life happens, and um, you know, he got out of a bad relationship and he wasn't allowed to see his kids, which were his life. And um, I got a call, you know, I'm in, I'm in recovery, my brother's in recovery. I'm at a recovery meeting and I hear uh, somebody slam something and break something and then I hear a curse word and it was my brother. And I ran out of the bathroom, I said, Sam, what's going on? And he goes, we just lost Derek. And I, and I just, my mouth fell open and and then Sam looked at me and he goes, you know, I got to chair this meeting. Will, you know, like, will you be strong for me to chair this meeting? And I said, yeah, I got you. Let's let's do it because the meeting was starting in, in about one minute and my brother had to chair it. So my brother goes, starts reading through all the stuff. My brother's sitting at the front of the table. I'm to his left. He starts reading the preamble, going through the beginning of the meeting. And then he starts the meeting and he calls the, on the guy across the table from him. And he goes, and the guy turns it around on my brother and says, no, Sam, we'd like to hear from you. And Sam began to share about Derek, and I just lost it. I start weeping and sobbing in the middle of this meeting. I run outside of the room. I'm walking down the street. There's tears streaming down my face. I look up at the sky. I said, Lord, what, what is going on? We lost Derek. What is going on? And just as loud as I'm talking to you right now, I hear the words, No greater love hath this than a man to lay down his life for his friends. And it was in that instant... I had a spiritual experience because the vision for Dread Champions has been in my spirit for 15 years. And it was like in an instant I got the, the willingness to see this ministry birthed in the earth. And I looked up at the sky and I said, thank you, Derek. And, um, and you know, that's, that's my story. And that's why this, this is the first night of Derek's house. This is why we are honoring Derek's death. And later on down the road, months down the road, I find out, um, I'm talking to her husband, Don, and Don tells me that an intercessor, a powerful prophetic intercessor, had called the family and um, had told Don that he had a vision of when Derek died, and, and Derek was communing with the Lord, and the Lord gave him a choice on whether he wanted to come back or whether he wanted to stay in heaven, and, and Derek chose to stay in heaven, and I... When I heard that, I thought, you know, what if the Lord had showed Derek what his sacrifice would mean and the fruit and the thousands and thousands of souls that are going to be touched and changed and healed by this ministry? And Derek chose to lay his life down. Because when I heard those words out on that street, no greater love hath this than a man to lay down his life for his friends, it didn't make sense to me. Because Derek didn't lay down his life. He didn't kill himself, you know. And so when I heard Dawn share that about this intercessor's vision, that really blew me away. That was another piece of the, the puzzle that blew me away. But, you know, that's is why we're calling it Derek's house. And we're honoring his death and his sacrifice. 
and I know that many lives, like the girls that you just heard, um, testimonies have already been touched and changed, but there's going to be thousands upon thousands because there's a real momentum on this ministry. There's a real favor of the Lord, and um, things are really beginning to happen. So I'd really like to hear Gwen's, this is Derek's mom, I'd really like to hear Gwen share. Um, you know, she's an awesome, awesome lady, and she's got a powerful, her own powerful testimony about what she's been through. I'll start sort of in um, the last of Derek's life, and then I'll move backwards. And excuse me, I really want to not cry, but um, because I know that God is nothing but good, and I know my son is in heaven, and I'll see him again. But it took Derek. Um, the, when they found Derek, um, the coroner said that he had been in a coma for probably 18, 19 hours. And he was out in plain sight, sitting in his car with lots of people walking, going back and forth. And um, so there was a long period of time when Derek was in the transition from this room to the eternal room. And I know that God communicated and communicated my son. My son loved God with his whole heart. He was an addict. And um, like Stephen said, he stayed clean and sober many, many years and served God and loved God. And he was a magnanimous, lovely, very, very handsome man. Mm. <laughs> High energy. I'm to paint your car three times in one day. <laughs> and um, um, his death, um, I know, is going to, that God is going to use my son's death and passing. So I don't doubt that during that time that Derek was in that coma all those hours, that he was communing with God. And I won't know till I get to eternity all that that entailed, but I feel confirmation in my spirit, which really blew me away at first, that he chose to leave this life, because uh, he has five children, ranging from the age of 18 to four, and he adored his kids, and that, and that's what took him off the deep end in the last, um, really, but nonetheless, as far as my story, what happened to me, um, I raised my kids, Christian school, Christian home. Uh, to the best of my ability. I love the Lord. I, I got born again when I was 22. And um, grew up, my kids grew up with Stephen's kids and tons of others in a church and a Christian school. And we were sort of a little island under ourselves. And it got very unhealthy. And after 22 years, the church blew up. And my sons, they were, they were really affected by that. And um, addiction runs through my blood lineage. I and myself am a recovering alcoholic, and all of my three sons are alcoholics addicts. So right about the time that the church blew up, um, they're really close in age, and one by one, they got into drugs and alcohol and crimes and carrying guns and doing really, really dangerous things. And I was mind-boggled. I, I couldn't figure out how God could let me down like that. It's like, to the best of my ability, although I know that our hearts, you know, are deceived, I really love the Lord and sought God and gave my time, my money, my energy. All of my commitments were that way, and I felt like God had let, let me go into a deception, and as a result, my children were gone astray. It's a very fearful time in my life. I lived under fear, dread, doom, tremendous anxiety and panic that um, either one of my children uh, would die or kill somebody under the influence of substances. And I used to say to God, well, there's a scripture that says that all things work together for good to those that love God, all things. And that scripture would come to my mind and I would just basically scream, hell no, are you freaking kidding me? You let one of my kids die? a drug-related cause, and that'll be the end of me. 